in the lab. Well, long story short, they're so good that they have an undefeated season in their league and they make it to the state championship game in Sacramento. Of course, they win the state championship, beating a Bay Area team like LA always does. So on paper, everything in Zaire's life is looking good. A good GPA, winning a state championship, and also getting noticed on the AAU circuit. In fact, he was playing so well that he skipped his senior year of high school to go play at a basketball prep school in Mississippi. Now you'd think that with this great opportunity, Zaire would go into it with a positive mentality. Now that I'm out of state, I'm gonna leave the gang stuff behind me and simply focus on basketball. But sadly, for whatever reason, he simply cannot let the street life go. So right after his senior year at the prep school, he catches his first case. As he's riding around Mississippi in a car with no registration, the troopers get behind him. And because he has an illegal weapon in the car, he decides to take him on a chase. So he bends a few blocks, giving him enough time to roll down the window. So you telling me Brick Baby was raw in basketball? Why he ain't keep playing basketball? Do it throw out the clip and then throw out the weapon. So then after getting rid of it, he rolls his window up and then pulls over so they can talk to him. Unfortunately for him, the officers did see him throw it, so they go around and they end up finding it. At this point, everything he's worked hard for is at jeopardy. He could quickly become a felon. However, because of a technicality in Mississippi law, he gets off with a misdemeanor. Through the gun, so they found the gun with no clip. That's a misdemeanor. Because it wasn't like... Well, while this is going on and he's sitting in a jail cell, he does receive some very good news. And while I'm there, I get an acceptance letter from Clark Atlanta University. So now he has the amazing opportunity to play on Clark Atlanta's basketball team and to go to school for free. Well, after presenting this to the court, the judge thankfully allows him to get out of jail just two days before orientation. What day do you start orientation? He let me out two days before orientation, so I couldn't do no gang banging or nothing. <sighs> This was a close call, but thankfully they let him off easy and he's able to now focus on... Well, is he? Oh, hell nah. You'd think that catching that case would scare him straight, like everything I've worked hard for almost was out of my hands. Like now I'm gonna focus on basketball in school and definitely stay out of trouble. But nope, Zaire's entrance to Atlanta would be quite the opposite. At <laughs> the swamp code, he keep calling him Zaire. As soon as he touches down in the city, he links up with his Rolling 60s cousins who now run with BMF. So while his classmates are sleeping in the dorms and kicking it on campus, he's with Big Meech at the club and sleeping in his mansion as well. So I'm the youngest little dude, you know what I'm saying, young in the club, 17, 18, I'm with Meech and them though. And as soon as he was introduced to their lifestyle, he fell in love with it and was willing to do anything to impress Big Meech including trapping and moving weight while being a full-time college student. So just like that, an 18-year-old Zaire is risking his freedom once again. And unfortunately, during his second semester, it would all catch up to him. While heading down the interstate with 75 pounds in his car, a Georgia State trooper gets behind him. He throws some of the bags out of the window, but unfortunately, they catch up to him before he can get rid of it all. And just like that, Zaire is arrested and is facing a serious Class A felony. While enrolled as a college student, he's now facing up to eight years in prison. At this moment, everything he's ever worked for is now way out of the window. They caught him red-handed with serious weight, and he's going to be sitting in prison. 75 pounds? Right baby, bro, what the fuck? Prison for quite some time. Well, long story short, he pleads guilty to the felony, and now his future is at the hands of a judge. Somehow he gets another lenient judge who sentences him to five months in jail, and ten years probation. Receiving only four months for 75 pounds is very strange, especially in the South. On top of this, during this exact time, BMF was taken down and all of them got 15 to 20 years. With four new big arrests, Atlanta police believe they have just about shut down the so-called Black Mafia family. And as our Julia Harding reports, these suspects were hiding out in one of the city's most popular areas. Anyone tied to BMF um, typically has an extensive criminal history, so we consider them to be very violent. Hold on, Swamp. What you telling me? What you trying to say? So... You just, so four months, 75 pounds. Oh. 
something adding up, bro. Federal agents seized this limo with secret compartments that had almost a million dollars hidden inside. An organization that at one time claimed to rule Atlanta. Now agents say that's no longer the case. So now with all of BMF arrested, Zaire just threw his life away for nothing. You started trapping to impress them and now you'll probably never see them again. <laughs> So now that he doesn't have a school to go to or a crew to hang out with, he only has a choice but to return back to Los Angeles. So right after his release from Fulton County Jail, he makes his glorious return to the wicked Overhill Los Angeles streets. It's now the fall of 2006 and Zaire is back to ground one, hanging out with his 60s homies in the hood. He's now just another failed high school athlete who's back in the hood doing absolutely nothing. We all know some- See, that's why niggas be hot. Niggas say he's just a failed athlete. Nigga break his nigga on his way. You understand me? But shit. Some of those, don't we? But not only is he doing nothing productive, he's also in the process of risking his life every single day. Why, you might be wondering? Well, because while he was in Atlanta, his little homie Eric Holder was causing havoc in the streets. <laughs> So upon Zaire's return to LA, he was putting his life in immediate risk. It's an early October afternoon and Zaire and Eric are rolling through the set headed to their local corner store. Zaire has his shirt off and a blick sitting in his lap as they get to the store. So when Eric parks the car, Zaire hops out and puts his blick under his seat. He then reaches for the back door so he can grab his hoodie and put it on. But that's when he's met with a barrage of gunfire. Shots are flying from all the way across the street, but somehow Zaire is hitting his shoulder. It then ricochets and hits him in his neck, which completely shatters his back. So now he's laying on the- Damn. So I do remember Brick telling this story, and I do remember him saying Eric saved his life. Floor and can't move anything under his waist. Thankfully, that's when Eric runs around to him, picks him up, and ties him down in the front seat. He then runs around to his side of the car, hops in, and speeds away to the hospital. They ended up taking me, my boy was panicking, driving 100 miles per hour, I'm like, man, slow down, because I didn't have no feeling, so my neck keep, I'm like, bro. Thankfully, he ends up surviving after making it to the hospital, but that's when the doctors give him devastating news. Like, I was in the bed, like, when I first got shot, and he was rubbing the bottom of my feet, so what happened, my nerves were shattered. I had fractured my neck. I'm telling them, like, I could feel you rubbing my foot. He's like, no, you can't, you're paralyzed, you'll be, uh... He's like a Middle Eastern dude. You'll be you'll be paralyzed forever. You'll never walk again. I'm like, bro, I just felt you rub. Damn. Well, so with him they, and look who they got working on him. He telling you he feel your damn you tickling his foot. My feet. He's like, you wanna feel me rubbing your feet? I'm like, what the. F so for six months he lays in a hospital bed, thinking that he'll be in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. A whole lot of time to lay there and think about all of his wasted potential. So now he's pissed off at his rivals and he tells Eric to go put in work. So from what we know, Eric Holder immediately hit the streets and started knocking down rivals. So not only did he save his life, but he also, allegedly, eliminated those who did this to his friend. Eric's loyalty to Zaire was- Oh, see, that's why. See, I didn't know he was Eric, they was that close. I, I remember he said that story, but then he, I didn't know he told him to go handle that unparalleled. He was basically forever indebted to his life. Well, after months of being angry in a hospital bed, a miracle comes out of nowhere. We sitting inside the hospital, we watch the TV, and I just move my legs up like, is it, what the f*** are you doing? I'm like, I was like, oh shit, I was trying to get comfortable. And my legs just moved. She was like, what the f***? Like, oh, she ran and got the nurse. Went to rehab, physical therapy after that for like four months. Somehow, after six months, he's able to fully recover and get back on his feet. And after his full recovery, he would smartly get out of the LA streets and head back to Atlanta. Now, you may be thinking that this was his wake-up call to get out- This nigga swap crazy. He gonna put the damn nigga- the, the, the nigga's helping the nigga out the wheelchair. And so mostly the nigga getting a checkup. Like, bro, you, hey, man, shout out Swamp Story. Out of the streets, but this wasn't the case at all. Instead, he heads back to Atlanta with a serious mission in mind, and he brings Eric with him.
Basically, he wants to become the king of the streets, the powerful leader of the Georgia Rolling Sixties. At this time, and really still to this day, the streets in the South had absolutely zero structure. Nobody listened or followed orders from anyone, and it was pretty much every man for himself. No certified OGs, DPs, put-ons, none of that. So essentially what Zaire was trying to do was bring the Los Angeles way to Georgia, where he could have people under him and serving anything he wanted. So in order to do this, he hit the streets hard and recruited new members, guys who were under him and who would do anything he said. And in the process, believe it or not, they took over some serious hoods, and this is how Zaire truly made his name in Atlanta. From the notorious Four Seasons Apartments, the West End, and a Southside hood known as Shady Park. While in the process of expanding the set, Zaire unfortunately brought some havoc to the streets. In typical LA fashion, he began robbing and extorting rappers. And I just thought about something. So, bro, you couldn't feel your, you couldn't feel him tickling your feet, cause you see why your girl run out the damn house, the, the the room to go get the doctors. It, you know what I'm saying? She was surprised you could move your damn feet, so you could, you was fake paralyzed. It's good you back walking now, but I'm saying like the fuck. A trend that Atlanta had never seen before. Nah, that's somebody I robbed. That was Gucci best friend. This is how he becomes known for robbing in Atlanta, somebody that you'd rather have on your side than against you. So he's basically extorting people for friendships, but on the flip side, he's also pretty intelligent. After befriending a local Rolling 60 by the name of Pee Wee Longway, he ends up running his bag up like never before. If you're unfamiliar, Pee Wee was a very well-known hustler in the streets of Atlanta, known for running up millions. And because of this, he had connections to the up-and-coming and major rappers in Atlanta. I met everybody through Pee Wee Longway. That's my brother. That's like my brother-in-law. As they were constantly in studios and surrounded by rappers, they decided to join together and to start a music label. This would be known as Money Piles and Ammo, also known as MP. <laughs> that nigga Thug was really also bullshit when he first came out. Feel me? And he, he was doing it, he, you know, he had, it was a, it was a, a, a ends to a, a means to an ends, right? But, but it was crazy, you know, he was wearing them dresses and shit. Yeah. Okay, so you guys start rolling together and you guys start MPA together. We around it so much, let's pay for some studio time, shoot a couple videos, let's just see where this shit goes. Unfortunately, they had no idea how to properly run a business, but aside from that, Zaire had a special ear for talent. In fact, he discovered Young Thug in 2008 and actually started managing his career early on. Without having him signed to any sort of paperwork, Zaire had him in the studio and was also introducing him to some bigger names. In fact, in 2009, he even brought him to LA to try to get him in the studio with Nipsey Hussle. I started showing him the game with, with, with what's going on on the West Coast too. Right. You know, I took him in front of Nip in like 09 and told him to work with him. And Nip was like iffy. Thug was slime then. He was real. He was real. Like, you know what I'm saying? He right. was out here robbing shit, doing all this, you know, really? regular hood. So the point is that he was helping out Atlanta artists and he had a really good ear for talent. So not only does he have a potentially major label at his hands, but he's also doing pretty well financially. In fact, it's really crazy how Brick Baby been in the mix for hella long and how it all come back full circle. You feel me? This shit crazy. Back in 2009, he copped a nice condo in Sandy Springs, a fly whip, and you know, he was just doing his thing. Once again, things are truly looking good for him, but sadly, this is when he's met with some terrible luck. October 22nd, 2009. It's a Thursday night in North Atlanta, and Zaire is headed down Interstate 19, headed towards downtown. As he's cruising down, a Georgia State Patrol gets behind him and runs his tags. Unfortunately, he never registered the car, so the officer hits the cherries. Ah shit, here we go again. Zaire knows that he's riding dirty as a convicted felon, so he smashes on the pedal. Now he's on a high-speed chase, cutting in and out of traffic in Buckhead, and then, skirt, he smashes into a pole. <laughs> Just like that, the officers are able to pull him out of the car and they find weapons inside. This time, it's no joke as he's facing four separate felonies. So already being a convicted felon, he's looking at up to 12 years in prison. But somehow, once again, Zaire is able to completely avoid prison and only get a few months in jail. What? A convicted felon and documented Rolling 60s Crip only gets a few months in jail for four separate felonies. That makes no sense in my mind. Well, once again he gets off easy and he's right back on the streets in early 2010. But not for long. On July 28th, 2010, he would have another high speed. So, so, 
we keeping up with this shit. Let's just make sure we keeping up. He go down for the seventy five pounds, get four months in a in a in a you know what I mean? Then he go down just now and get another fucking slap on the wrist. In the south too, in the in the what? They would want nothing more than to lock a nigga up for he ever. So I don't know, man. This shit is crazy. Chase while on probation, and yet again he's caught with a weapon and facing 10 years in prison. But mysteriously, the judge lets him off easy and he only does 18 months. Now before you call him a snitch or an informant, do understand that this is Fulton County, which is a complete joke. Well, regardless, it's now 2012 and the MPA boss returns to the streets. While he was away, Pee Wee Longway was able to discover young rappers Lil Durk, Rich Homie Quan, and a group called the Migos. Rich Homie Quan before he came out. I'm hearing 21 Savage before he came out. So as soon as Zaire got out of prison, he was connected with them and actually started helping their careers. Not only did he pay for their studio time and connect them with rappers, but he also provided them with protection. Durk being an outsider from Chicago and the Migos being suburban wannabes, they both both could use some protection. But most importantly, the biggest thing he provided was protection whenever the rappers went to LA. In fact, he even brought Future to LA for the very first time. You know what I'm saying? I've been that person, like bringing them out here. Like, I had Future. I turned to LA on the Future. I, 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 nobody, I was listening to Dirty Sprite One. You know, I bought them out here to do a song with Nip. Essentially, he was every rapper's connection whenever they'd go to LA. He was the first and only call. Remember this, because it will be very important. Well, as we know, everyone around him and Pee Wee was getting rich and famous during this period. And after a while, they got kind of tired of being the guys in the background, and they wanted to try rapping for themselves. So Zaire would become MPA Shitro or MPA Brick Baby, and Pee Wee was still Pee Wee Longway. Early on, things were looking bright for the duo, as they had the help of Dirk, Future, Young Thug, Gucci Man, and more. Basically, it's crazy how everybody went on to be, I guess, Femi. The niggas he was kind of like associated with and in a mix with, they went on to be fake great. You know what I'm saying? And Brick, 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 he, he, do, he, I ain't say, you feel me? I ain't saying, you know what I mean? I'm just saying, like, nigga. Because of everything they had done for them, if they ever needed a feature, it was done right away. But then, unfortunately, as things are going up for Brick Baby, he catches another felon in possession charge in Los Angeles. <laughs> And this time he's sentenced to three years in prison. As he's sitting in a lonely prison cell, everyone around him is getting rich and famous. Young Thug signs with Birdman and blows up, Future blows up, Lil Durk blows up, Rich Homie Quan blows up, Pee Wee Longway blows up, well, kind of, but you get the point. Oh, and don't forget that the Migos get a feature with Drake and they're out of here as well. So literally everyone who was with him in Atlanta completely blow up and get nationally famous. All while Zaire Brick Baby is sitting in a California prison with no fame or nothing. Damn, that would shatter any man's ego, and don't act like it wouldn't. But on the flip side, because they're all rich and famous now, he assumes that once he gets out, they'll definitely put him on. So three long years go by, and Brick Baby is finally released. It's 2015 and Brick Baby is finally home expecting a warm welcome. But as soon as he touches down, a harsh reality kicks in. These guys are not your real friends. Aside from Thug, Pee Wee, and Dirk, his friends were not there to help him out and pretty much wanted nothing to do with him. You, you know, you told me earlier that you've been cut off. People cut you off or something of that sort. My, my industry friends that I thought was my friends now. Free YSL, Gunna Slime. Y'all did, you know what I'm saying? You, you already know, we ain't even gotta talk long are we, way. Are we speaking Dirt. like a... After everything he did for some of his friends in the industry, he really took it hard. So bro, we could go through DMs or when you was up and coming, we could do that. I just feel like they wanted to be around me when they was broke because they didn't have nothing. So now you a millionaire now, you don't want that type of pressure. Yeah, I remember you telling these stories a few times, you know. And it's crazy because I seen him. I mean, he been in the mix with shit. I don't know. Around. But you think I'm going to turn that energy on you? You my boy. I love you. I wouldn't give a fuck if you had a dollar or a billion. I'm going to treat you the same way. Brick Baby was now a peon or an afterthought to many people he helped out. And this truly hurt his ego. Now, instead of being the guy who helps out rappers and protects them, he reverts to being the guy who wants to rob them. <laughs>
Don't come to LA. Unless your name is Dirk, Thug, or Pee Wee, you better tuck your tail. So as the streets tell it, Brick Baby becomes the biggest chain collector in LA. Basically, he had his young Rolling Sixties members doing serious homework in the streets. This included having them sit at the airport for rappers to come to town and then following their cars back to their hotel. Then they'd relay all of this information back to Brick and he'd do with it what he pleased. So basically, without them knowing, rappers were being tracked by Brick Baby the second they stepped foot in LA. Then he and the Rolling Sixties would wait for the perfect opportunity to strike and then they'd get up on him and give me everything you got. So just like that, he went from being known as the helpful guy in the industry to the boogeyman. And because of this reputation, he would be featured on YG's notorious song, Don't Come to LA. Don't come to LA, Raffles for their jewelry. <laughs> Bro, LA is so corny, bro. But anyways, as the YG feature would help his recognition, he was still hurting financially. How I know this? Well, he was now 29 years old and still taking penitentiary chances. And that takes us to September 21st, 2017. <laughs> it's an early Thursday afternoon on the west side of LA, and Brick and two Rolling 60s members are masking up for a lick. In particular, they aim to hit a high-end jewelry store in the wealthy Marina Del Rey. So at 1 p.m., they arrive in front of the store in a gray Range Rover SUV. Then they quickly hop out of the car and run inside the store with bags. Once they're able to secure a few expensive items, they run out of the store and hop back in the Range Rover. Brick then quickly speeds away, not realizing that LAPD are already behind him. After bending a few blocks, he hears the sirens and knows they're in trouble. So he instantly punches the gas and busts a left down a residential road. This is when he finally realizes that it's a dead end street. So now he has no choice but to stop the car and run inside a nearby apartment. While he barricades himself in the lobby, police completely surround the area. And from here, a six hour standoff begins. Brick Baby in the 60s versus LAPD. Finally, at 7.30 p.m., Brick Baby surrenders. I wonder how Swamp find out about that story. I want, I want, did Brick tell that story too? He ain't told his whole criminal history on these interviews. Misunderstanding tonight, or was it justified? A local rapper arrested after a tense standoff with officers in Marina Del Rey, but his family says police got the wrong guy. NBC4's Beverly White just spoke with his family and police. Beverly. That's right, Chuck. LAPD says it started with a 20-minute pursuit this afternoon of a man traveling in a silver Range Rover, and it ended when he ducked into this apartment building in the 13,900 block of Pan A Way. That music video from YouTube is of local rap artist Brick Baby, the 29-year-old now in LAPD custody after a standoff in Marina Del Rey, identified by his mother, who declined to give her name. The already three-time felon is facing two more of them things. Because of his history and the severity of the charges, he's facing up to 15 years in prison. Definitely nothing to scoff at. Of course, his family doesn't want to see him go away for a long time. And because of this, they go on the news and blame everything on his co-defendant. His mom goes on the news and says, My son didn't rob anyone. In fact, he doesn't even own a gun. And get ready for this one. His friend is actually the one who robbed the store, and Brick only drove him away because of adrenaline. So she evidently threw his co-defendant under the bus. And I don't know, is this snitching? It's his mom, but... Yeah. Hey, I know, I know. So this happened, huh? So, so. Shit. Damn. Uh, like, so, so what? Man. The snitching, right? Well, long story short, Brick is let off easy again as he's sentenced to four years in prison. And even though this isn't that much time, with four felonies on his record, what is he gonna do for the rest of his life? Obviously, this is a harsh reality for a guy in his 30s, but sadly, during his prison stay, things get even worse. The music world is mourning Grammy-nominated rapper Nipsey Hussle, who was killed in a shooting in Los Angeles. Hussle was shot multiple times yesterday in a parking lot outside his clothing store. What he meant to the community, if you want to look around right now, every single person that's out here, spending their time here, they're here because he spoke to them in some way, he inspired them in some way, 
they related to him in some way. He meant a lot. He meant everything to the community. You know, he was an entrepreneur. He was employing people. He loved his community. He was encouraging them and empowering them to be more, to do more with their lives. So that's why we're here today. The city of LA, and more specifically the Rolling Sixties, lost a legend, and unfortunately, Brick Baby would learn from a prison cell. Oh no, I'm playing poker in the day room. So I'm playing poker, and a dude from Blackstone come over from Jungles. He come over like, shitty blood, like they killed Nip. I'm like, stop playing with the set. Immediately, I'm like, stop playing, bro. I get on the phone, I'm like, hey, what they talk about with Nip? They like, yeah. He, he just got killed. And I'm like, huh? How did somebody come into the parking lot and kill bro? Like, he supposed to be untouchable in this parking lot. You get what I'm saying? Like, Brick is completely devastated and confused. And, it and, then, and then, right, to speak of rest in peace, Nip, but, but what I was thinking about with Miles, right, and she, she is severe, she don't, you know what I'm saying? It's not the, it just, it just, you know, and they, they say that was a rumor, the shit that happened with Eric Holder family, but, you know, that is a thing where, they, you know, a nigga family get out of pocket and get to telling them people too much or snitching or whatever have you. They, you know, y'all gotta go. You can't, you can't live here no more. So, you know, I wonder who he was with and how they feel about moms doing that. You know, that shit, she like, bro, this shit, I'm just pointing it out because, you know, this air shit, but. It's even worse when he finds out who did it. His little homie Eric Holder, the one who saved his life and put in work when he was paralyzed. And once he heard the story of how it transpired, this is what hurt him the most. Basically, he was with his girlfriend and he walked up to Nipsey in front of his store. And when he goes to dap him up, Nipsey refuses to shake his hand and calls him a rat. This is a major violation in the LA street code. You do not call someone a rat without paperwork and especially not in front of their girl. So Eric being one of the only actual steppers from the rolling 60s, he feels completely played and wants to do something to Nipsey. So long story short, he goes to his car, grabs his blick and walks back to the block. Then in front of an entire crowd of rolling 60s members, he walks right up to Nipsey and lets him have it. After emptying his clip, he simply walks away as Nipsey's friends are frozen in shock. And because of how quickly and emotionally this happened, Brick realizes that if he was there, he could have calmed down Eric and made everything okay. Now look, I get wind that it's Cub, I'm like, oh, Cub, I'm like, man, I'm just like, man, how one of my close friends killed my other close friend while I was in jail. And so you always think like, damn, if I was on the streets, could I have stopped it? I probably could have took him to go smoke and slide and we could have went somewhere and that shit would have never happened. How Eric Holder- It's crazy because when you hear Brick say that, you be thinking like, who the fuck Brick think he is? Could have stopped, but they was, that was his pot, they was real close. He, he had some influence a little bit, you know what I'm saying? Who was able to do this in front of all those people is beyond me, but it is California at the end of the day. And on top of this, instead of going by their own code and holding court in the streets, they decided to testify against him in court. What? What I've now learned doing this for a few years is that all of these LA street codes that they all say they abide by are pretty much never enforced. Or at least they pick and choose who they want to enforce them on, and on top of this, they're always contradicting themselves. But either way, we move on to another rapper loss that involves the rolling 60s. And that takes us right back to Atlanta, Georgia. As we all know, in the summer of 2020, Chicago rapper King Von would start an internet beef with Baton Rouge's NBA Youngboy. I guess it started over a girl, but for the sake of the video, the details don't really matter. Well, because of Youngboy's close friendship with Rolling 60s rapper Quando Rondo, he was implicated in the beef as well. So for months, Von would instigate the beef and they would go back and forth online. Then eventually, Vaughn would take the internet beef to the streets. On the night of November 6, 2020, Quando Rondo and his friend Lil Tim would be at a lounge in Atlanta. Vaughn, who now happened to be living in Atlanta as well, would get word of this and he would pull up to the lounge. So while Lil Tim is sitting in the Escalade and Quando Rondo is standing outside, King Vaughn would pull up on him and start whooping his <laughs> As soon as Tim sees what's going on and Quando's on the ground surrounded by the Chicago goons, he lets off. Bam. Atlanta police say two people are dead after an officer involved shooting here on Trinity Avenue in downtown. 
As dawn turned to daylight, you could make out dozens of evidence markers. GBI crime scene investigators combing the scene. It hurt us. It hurt us a lot. I cried. Some some of my friends cried. He, he, he had a big influence on us. A really big influence. Obviously, this was a monumental moment. Where it all started. It's where it all started, though. So, so I mean, man, it's because people, a lot of people have been going, last couple of days, they've been going over uh, Break Baby and the coincidences and shit like that. And, and also, I just seen a nigga, uh, Quando Rondo, at, with academics. They up there doing an interview. And it was, it, it, it was strange. It was a little strange. And Qu guess what? Quando, it was strange because Quando, you could see he was anticipating certain questions, right? And, and one of the questions I think he was anticipating, because it's some new shit that come out about Quando in this case with Dirk and them. Supposedly, Quando Rondo been working with them people. I don't know in what fashion, right? You know, usually when they say that, they it mean like a motherfucker is infidel. But yeah, man, I seen some shit about you know he him going in and being and it's crazy because academics told us right that Quando Rondo would have had to know about the assassination on his life and all because they was already finna pick Dirk and them up. So the deep po po the people already had to contact him like, man, you know that and catching fades and hanging out in front of their million dollar hoods where nothing happens and they talk about how crazy it is. But the point is that Brick Baby did the unthinkable and went against his own flag for his millionaire friend, going against everything he's ever said he stood for. And that just shows you the true character of Brick Baby, just grimy and slimy. Are you ready from the treasures that you showing love? Cause we not gonna get on your ass. You get what I'm saying? Cause you got it like how we got it. Cause you got it like how we got it. Cause you got it like how we got it. It's these pretending ass need. You don't have a hood that you taking care of. You're not from the hood. Mm. 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 So now that we know where Brick Baby stands, let's focus back on the beef between Lil Durk and Quando. From all so that's why it was strange that the nigga Quando did that live with Brick. But you know why it wasn't strange, really? It makes sense now when we hear the shit that Quando, all this shit that Quando been in communication with the FBI and all that. Feel me? He trying to get documents sealed. Uh, 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 shout out Active Chucks. You understand me? Yayo and Do Sims, they brought this information to the forefront. That's where I heard it from. You know? accounts, Quando and the Savannah Rolling 60s never wanted beef with Vaughn and really never wanted this to happen at all. And despite the fact that all Lil Tim did was defend his friend, Lil Dirk still wants get back for Vaughn. Well given that Dirk lives in Atlanta and Quando and his boys are only a few hours away, you'd think that he'd send a hit to Savannah. But because Quando and his boys would have home field advantage, and it's the south where everyone's packing heat, it's not necessarily an easy hit. But instead, Dirk waits patiently for them to go to a particular city, a city where he knows he can get them gone. This of course would be the city of Los Angeles, which for three reasons would be the perfect place for him to do it. If Quando and his boys are in LA, they have no home field advantage, in fact they probably don't know where they are at any time. And secondly, they won't be strapped, because the laws in California make it pretty much impossible to do so. And the third reason? None other than Brick Baby. As we know, Brick Baby is the king of hawking down rappers as soon as they touch down in the city. And not only can he give you Quando's exact location, but he can also supply you with what you need. You know. Well, from what the FBI states, Lil Durk waits patiently for Quando and his boys to go to LA. And that day would finally come, nearly two years after the demise of Vaughn, August 18th, 2022. It's a regular morning like any other when Lil Durk gets a call from an unknown source informing him of Quando's presence in LA. This is the opportunity he's been waiting for, so he seizes it and he quickly calls an OTF member by the name of Vani. OTF Vani, whose real name is Kavon Grant, is a certified stepper from Detroit who's known for getting things done. So as soon as Dirk gets the information on Quando, he calls up Vani and has him fly on his private jet to come meet him. So according to investigators from here, Dirk and Vani have a meeting where they discuss what needs to be done. And because of Vani's reputation for allegedly- So this shit ain't looking good, Brick. You was on the internet talking about how you be tracking niggas down to the airport and you got these resources and- Or was did Swamp say that or did Brick say that or did Brick say- or did Swamp say Brick said that? 
Oh no. Getting people slumped, he's tasked with handling all the logistics. This includes booking flights, hotel rooms, rental cars, and basically handling everything that needs to be done. So as soon as the meeting wraps up, Vani immediately gets to planning. First, he gets in contact with four reputed OTF steppers, hand-picked by him. These would be DeAndre Wilson, also known as Dee Dee, Keith Jones, also known as Flocka, David Lindsay, also known as Brown Eyes, and Asa Houston, also known as Boogie. He informs them of the mission at hand and tells them to immediately get ready. Then, he makes a massive mistake. Using OTF credit cards, he books them red-eye flights to Los Angeles. Coincidentally, just minutes after doing this, Dirk texts him, Hey, don't book no flights under my name or anything that has to do with me. <laughs> Too late, buddy. Not only did he already use the OTF card to get them flights, but he also got them hotel rooms as well. On top of this, one of the hitters DMs his girl on Instagram and lets her know that he's on his way to Los Angeles. Regardless, this doesn't stop anything, and the four OTF hitters head to the airport for their midnight flight. Okay, so now that all the travel is handled, Vonnie hops on a private jet headed to Los Angeles. So the nigga go, he, he, he continued to book the flight through dark shit after dark told you, why you ain't just canceling and book some, y'all still was fried. They was fucking watching you niggas, man. And ain't no telling if Dirk really talked. So what they got, some recordings of Dirk or, or some messages from Dirk saying, like, yo, don't book it in my shit. Like, bro, that shit was crazy. Like, bro, I'm telling you, it had to be niggas just thinking it was just untouchable. Because why else would you do it, bro? Why would you? That, it don't make sense, bro, that a nigga would do that. I don't know. He touches down in the early morning, and now it's time for him to get everything together. August 19th, 2022, 7 a.m. Vani takes an Uber to a luxury car rental and gets a BMW M5 and an Infiniti G37. He then wipes them down individually and takes them to get tinted. While waiting for the cars, he takes an Uber to Big Five Sporting Goods where he buys four ski masks and four pairs of gloves. Oh, and not to mention, he again uses the OTF credit card. Well, once he leaves the sporting goods store, there's only two things left for him to do. First, he needs some blicks. Secondly, he needs to find out exactly where Quando Rondo is. And here is where two new mystery men come into the picture. Known to the FBI as Co-Conspirator 2 and Co-Conspirator 4. Well, after the rental cars are ready, Vonnie meets up with Co-Conspirator 2. And when they meet up, number two hands him a duffel bag full of <laughs> So they go their separate ways and Vonnie now meets up with number four. Together they go over strategy and number four tells him to follow him, he'll take him exactly to Quando's location. Ooh wee, it's really about to happen. And now they go to the hotel to pick up the rest of the hitters. From here, Vani and the hitters inside the M5 and Infinity follow number 4 to Quando's location. Aha, there he is. They spot his black Escalade on Melrose Avenue. Then number 4 messages them and tells them that that is in fact Quando's car. Now he vanishes off in the distance and allows the OTF hitters to do what they do. They're now tracking the black Escalade down Melrose, waiting for the perfect opportunity to strike. Well, after a few minutes of following, the Black Escalade busts a ride on Beverly Boulevard and pulls over to get some gas. Oh yeah, now it's the perfect time. They head up an alley. I thought, uh, what, didn't Brick say he was in jail or something when, when uh, this whole shit took place or something? I think Brick did say that, I don't know. Next to the gas station, park their cars and get out on foot. They then run into the gas station and absolutely light up the Escalade. After emptying over 100 shots, they run back to their cars and vanish off in the distance. Thankfully, Quando Rondo was untouched, but sadly, his best friend wasn't. Right now, the search is on for three people who police say shot at a Savannah rapper, killing a member of his entourage. It happened in Los Angeles, and cameras captured the aftermath. <laughs> Shots fired, a fight taken to the streets, and this chaotic scene, the ending of a shooting that started in Los Angeles, California. Sheriff's deputies pulling out a man who had been shot in an SUV. No! Savannah rapper Quando Rondo, a passenger in that car, frantic at the site. It all started at this mobile gas station at 5.30 Friday evening. LAPD says witnesses heard multiple gunshots, then watched a couple cars zoom off. Three people in one car shot at this black Cadillac Escalade. It's unclear if those inside shot back. If you think about it, Quando really ain't been right ever since. 
ever, he been he or really all these events that's been transpiring been making him spiral more and more. I ain't gonna lie, you trip off of it. Can I get can I get some space, please? It ended at Santa Monica Boulevard. Deputies found it peppered with bullet holes and a shattered window. One man inside, a member of Ronto's entourage, had been shot. The 23-year-old was taken to the hospital where he died. Uh, they pulled up, they were pumping gas, and it looks like they probably finished pumping gas, and the suspects uh, approached from the alley, got out of the car, and started shooting at those victims. Shortly after doing this, the OTF members wiped down the rental cars, put their plates back on, and returned them back to the owners. Now here is where things get interesting. After heading to the hotel and changing clothes, the four hitters head to Calabasas in an Uber to go to a burger restaurant. And there waiting for them is co-conspirator 2, who's there to discuss business and who gets paid what. Then once they come to a fair agreement, co-conspirator 2 takes a private jet to Chicago, and the rest of them head down to San Diego. This is where they wait for a couple of days, and a trustworthy friend of Dirk brings them a whole lot of money. Now this begs an important question, who does Dirk trust in California to handle a whole lot of his money? And on top of this, who did he trust to find Quando's location and to supply the weapons? Well, I have somebody in mind, and I definitely think he's either Co-Conspirator 2 or Co-Conspirator 4. Given everything we know about Brick Baby's history in the streets, his dislike for Quando Rondo, and his relationship with Dirk, it would only make sense. But not only does it make logical sense, but there's also a whole lot of information out there that will make you think that Brick Baby had something to do with this. So now let's get into the reasons why Brick Baby was certainly involved. Ooh, here we go. Reason number one. Directly after losing his friend, Quando Rondo blames the Rolling Sixties. Directly after the incident. So about the, I'm, 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 I'm ready to hear this shit out, you know, um, uh, uh, bruh, break, you know, bruh, this shit, so it's two, so it's, uh, it's a possibility of Brick being two of the Cocos, one of the, one of the two is Cocos Spirit 2 to Cocos Spirit 4, a nigga could be either one of them. I know that. Today, he goes on social media and posts this on his story. Basically, what he's saying is that he's done with the rolling 60s, he's putting down his flag because of disloyalty. Now ask yourself, why after this incident would he be upset with his own gang, so much so that he's gonna put his flag down because of disloyalty? Obviously, he knew something the world didn't, that the rolling 60s had something to do with the death of Lil Pab. And as we know from the indictment, somebody from LA gave up his address, so who else could it possibly be? Who else in Los Angeles would know Quando's exact location other than that alone, right? Because oh, uh, Quando was quite frantic, and and that alone adds to the shit that people were saying about this new shit with Quando being, you feel me, in contacts with them people and, and possibly infidel and shit like that, feel me. He probably didn't see no end in sight to this shit because niggas was acting so bloodthirsty. You know what I'm saying? He'd be like, and then he probably felt like, who the f can I run to? These niggas got these Apple music is black. Who the f he like, this shit is a, you feel me? His own gang who he's supposed to tap in with. And on top of this, which Rolling 60 would be connected to Dirk? Obviously Brick Baby. And that's just the first reason why I believe that Brick Baby is co-conspirator 4. And trust me, there's a whole lot of other reasons as well, all coming out of his own mouth. And now we're at reason number 2, Brick Baby hints at it and admits that he was involved. During the period after the incident, nobody was thinking that Lil Durk was involved because it happened in LA and the whole Rolling 60s thing. But that's when Brick Baby goes on No Jumper and reveals to the world that Lil Pab's death was get back for Vaughn. Oh yeah, Sloth of Vaughn, right? Yeah. They say you can't say that no more. Why? Oh yeah, cause of wait no wait no no like they who say died? You can't say that no more. Oh, cause of FVG Cash? Oh who? Nah, cause Lil Bob. Ooh wee, this is when people started to put two and two together. Lil Dirk had something to do with the death of Lil Pop. And isn't it interesting that one of Dirk's closest friends and Rolling 60s member is the one who revealed it? Well, WAC 100 thinks it's very odd as well. Could kind of turn into something, because if I'm not mistaken, he kind of made a comment like, <clears throat> I guess they can't say 
OTM didn't slide. It's no getting out of that. Listen, if he's just a random person, it's whatever. But he's somebody who's got photos with Dirk. He's been. Calabasas Mansion. In the co and they met up with the co-conspirator in Calabasas at a burger shop. So, hey, man. I don't fucking know what's going on. But I tell you this, man. Adam is talking about he ain't know the fizz was out. Nigga, who you think you talk? Only, only people, only motherfuckers that don't think, nigga, that there's some strange shit going on with you is these motherfuckers who are just, they ain't on, they on the spectrum. Let's say that. Pictures with all the OTF guys and stuff. It seems like kind of, that was before he even worked for No Jumper. That actually was the interview that made me like, you know what? I'm gonna fuck with you. Wait, what? That's why you hired him? Cause he snitched on Lil Dirt. <laughs> what? But anyways, let's continue. Because at the time, OTF was never mentioned. Right. He's the first one that made any type of anything that OTF was involved by saying, I guess they can't say they didn't slide for Vaughn no more. It's like, well, if this doesn't convince you enough, right after this, Brick Baby would drop a song where he basically incriminates himself. In a song called Not Enough, here's what he says. He was ducking trying to hide, now he in a blunt. We dropped a hundred shots, go dig your partner up. Then he says the last one we turned into a pack, we got a million plus. And now knowing what we know from the indictment of the co-conspirators getting paid, I mean, you know? But of course on the flip side, he could just be lying about the money, right? Except for the fact that after this, he mysteriously starts living- So, I shout out Swamp Stories, man. It's crazy, Brick. This shit not looking good, bro. You feel me? You, nigga, boy, this video is not good, bro. You understand? How you gonna, what you gonna say to some shit like this? Then, every time Brick talk, Brick got a good way of getting on the and talking and, and, and making it sound good, though. He do, nigga. So, I'm gonna wait and see his response to this shit. But, all these cases, bro. All these damn cases, man, just magically disappearing. You understand? Then you could, you, 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 you know, it, you know what was, was, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you what's real, right? The streets, I'm gonna tell you right now, you in the streets, you know, you, 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 you's an idiot, nigga. Cause ain't no, nowadays, they, it's, they smart. You feel me? And they crazy and they, they, uh, they just different. So it's just a different time, like, you got social media and hella shit. Nigga, niggas be having, bro, nigga don't, nigga get in that bitch and can't scroll for 30 minutes and get the panic in. Nigga going to withdraw, you think, nigga withdrawing from TikTok, meth, syrup, weed, hella shit. Nigga is finna give it up. What do you think? But yeah, y'all let me know what y'all think, man. Shout out Swan Stories. This was a good one. I watched it. It was great, bro. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it was. Y'all niggas, let me know what y'all think. I'ma had a link to this shit in the description so you can watch it. Say ho, you can't be playing with that paper ho. Then you need that yaper, need it now and not later ho. Say ho, you can't be playing with that paper ho. Then you need that yaper, need it now and not later ho. Say ho, I can't be playing with that paper ho. Then you need that yaper, need it now and not later ho.